Hello, and welcome back to Zim Tutorials for Adobe Animate. I'm Dr. Abstract. We're on our sixth tutorial, so if you haven't seen the tutorials, you should check back through the earlier ones. As a matter of fact, today we want to talk a little bit about a few more things based on tutorial five. So that was the last tutorial. Let's go to the Zim site now at zimjs.com. Uh, in the other tutorials, we introduced Zim as a JavaScript Canvas framework to code creativity. You can make all these types of things, press on those and see more information, get examples. In the code section, there's a bit on Zim Shim for Adobe Animate. So we're able to use Zim features inside of Adobe Animate. Um, Adobe Animate exports to CreateJS and Zim was built on CreateJS. So that's why all that works. So make sure to go back and take a look there. Let's go to Animate now. And this is the last one we made, the 05 tutorial when we were making a tile. Let's just review that. We go control enter. It made a tile and when we pressed, we had a, an emitter happen. That emitter wasn't really, uh, if we wanted to say explode each of these colors, it might be that when we press this one, we want orange things to explode when we, and I mean, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but I didn't do that, and I thought afterwards maybe you would have liked to see that. We sort of skirted the issue. It's a little more complex, but it shows one more step of these Zim V values, which were created in Zim 5, by the way, or Zim V, it's called the fifth version of, of Zim. Uh, you might recall that we have a Zim Duo technique, which was created in version 2 of Zim, Zim Duo. So Zim V values are dynamic parameters that, uh, that allowed us to set these colors dynamically in the tile, that allowed us to set the, uh, the radiuses dynamically. Um, so we can show you the last, the last type of that is a function. You can pass in a function and the results of the function will be tiled or uh, be sent into the emitter or wherever we're passing those parameters. So that's one thing. The other thing is I had mentioned that you could tile your movie clips. And when I went to check that just to make sure, it gave me a message in the console saying that movie clips can't be cloned. So there is a way that we can tile the movie clips. It's just we cannot clone that same movie clip over and over again. In this case, we've cloned the circle over and over again to tile the circle. But we have another setting in tile that is called the unique setting, where instead of cloning, it's you pass in an array of objects and it will tile that array of objects as long as you set the unique parameter to true. So why don't we show you that in this tutorial and we can show you that by cloning or by, by using unique uh, components. And that way we can discuss components a little bit too. There are things like buttons and sliders and dials. Oh my. So that's what we have in store for today. Uh, why don't we get started? We'll take a look at the code here, F9. So in terms of emitting colors based on what what um, color circle we pressed on. We'll do that here in the last code. But in terms of tiling uniquely, we'll create a new FLA and, and start working afresh. Okay, so let's just finish up that uh, emitter issue. So we were making these circles that were uh, randomly colored or did we pass in a series? We passed in a series, but okay, that's fine. Either random or series would be fine. So there we are um, receiving the series, and that means every time we tile, we'll go blue, then green, then orange. And if you take a look well, here, it was blue, then green, then orange, then blue, then green, then orange. Okay. Um, so when we press on the circle, when we press on the circle down here, we've made an emitter already, and note that the emitter has um, hard-coded, in a sense, hard code, uh, an array that is being passed in, and so it's going to emit randomly from this array. Well, no longer do we want to do that, so why don't we comment out this line? And instead, we will emit the results of a function, something like make circle, or well, make, what do we want to call it? Uh, sh they're the shards of the circle make um, remains, <laughs> make explosion, make, okay, make explosion, good enough. 
So that's now, uh, we're saying every time we tile, or sorry, every time we emit, we're going to call make explosion. And up here, we have the function make explosion. Uh, round brackets and squiggly brackets. So whatever this returns, for instance, if we return a new rectangle, we're not going to do rectangle, a new ranger, <laughs> new rectangle. Uh, this is just the default rectangle. We'll make it a little bit smaller so it doesn't uh, overwhelm us. So there we go. In make explosion, we're returning a new rectangle. And then here, when we emit, we're calling make explosions. So can you imagine what's going to happen now? I'm go control enter. And when we press on the tile, oh, it didn't work. What got broken? Let's have a look. Const emitter is the emitter. We're calling the function make explosion. Here is function make explosion return a new rectangle. You're getting any errors? F12. Yeah, uh, bad argument make explosion. Oh, okay. I see what's happened. Make explosion is the value. We were using the Zim uh, duo technique. So we need in here, the OBJ is make explosion. So just be careful. So you see how, because we had to get to the start pause parameter, we went to the Zim duo technique of the squiggly brackets. So we need object is make explosion, start paused is true. Note that the error told us here um, that it was a bad argument make explosion. And so it was trying to tell us that there is no, this is OBJ, that is a good argument. Start pause is a good argument. But when we just had make explosion, it told us that was wrong. And so that's helpful, isn't it? In other words, if we pass in the wrong parameter names in the Zim Duo technique, it will tell us, hey, one of these is wrong and tell us which one is wrong. That's handy. Okay, so we save that up and we control enter and now let's have a look. Good, there we go. So now we're emitting the results of that function. Can you kind of see how we're going to do this now? Every time we press, we need to record what color we pressed on. So here's our tile. We're pressing down on a certain E dot target. We can find out the E dot target's color by just asking. So, uh, but we're just gonna ask, but not only that, we'll have this function read uh, a variable. So we need a variable here called uh, let um, circle color, we'll call it circle color. And we'll just assign it there, or, or um, not assign it, we'll uh, declare it there, let circle color. And we declare it outside of both of these places so that we can access it. Then inside of here, we will say circle color is equal to e.target.color. Color. So now, as soon as we press, the circle color will be the e dot targets color. And then in our function right here, our rectangle, we're going to return a rectangle. By default, it was being returned as a black rectangle. Oh, I don't even want a rectangle though, so let's adjust this to a circle again. And in here, we'll give it a 30, seemed pretty decent. But here, we'll make it the color of circle color. So now when the emitter goes, which will happen when we spurt right here, there's spurting 10. When the circle goes, it will uh, call the make explosion and that will return a circle of the circle color that came from, from here. Okay, so we go control enter. There might still be one issue, but we can deal with that too. There's a blue, there's green. I almost want to have a bit of the white in there too, don't you? I mean, I don't, it doesn't matter too much, but if we say white here and perhaps a little bit less like three in pixels, then we get the following. Yeah, that's better, huh? So now we're emitting the color of what we pressed on, uh, which is handy. Oh, I see the error now. So I don't know if you can see it too. It's all of a sudden it's emitting different colors as well. 
The issue is we have pooling in the emitter. So it will do, uh, I think 100 is the default. It will emit 100 things and then start to repeat using those same things. And when it repeats, when the pooling kicks in, it's no longer paying attention to the, the true function that's being returned. I think we put it in the bugs a little while back that we might want to automatically turn off pooling if we passed in a function. Yeah, I guess we haven't fixed that, that yet. Um, yeah, I don't remember actually fixing that. But uh, what we can do is turn the pooling off. So uh, pool colon false, I think. So that would be a tricky one. You'd be wondering, oh, what the heck is going on? And so we thought that probably we should um, make it so that if we pass in the results of a function like that, then it won't, uh, it won't pool. Let me just check that. So uh, in Zim, we have the docs. So here's Zim right here. And there's the docs. We would look up emitter. And there's pool. So let's see how there's also pool min. Let's see how we can uh, deal with pool. So we'll come on down. Pool, default true, boolean. If true, makes as many particles as needed before recycling particles. This improves performance as the particles don't need to be made and old ones removed. Um, see also clear pool method to start collecting a new type of particle. All right, so at any time you can call clear pool and it will just restart again. There's also a pool min which says how many do you really want before? And, and I think, uh, anyway, if we set it to false, it, I, I believe it will not pool. So let's set that to false pool false and we go control enter. Now we should be able to press for longer without it pooling in theory. I think that's about when it started pooling before and note that it's not pooling. Okay, so that's probably okay when you've got the spurt on like this. Um, I We were easy, easily able to clear all that without any performance issues. It's just when the emitter is going for a long, long time, like thousands and thousands, which happens you know fairly quickly if an emitter is going right away, then it might start to bog a bit later. But for, certainly for something like what we just did, it's no problem at all. All right, so that's the first part of today's tutorial then, is just tidying up a little bit from the last time. <coughs> Excuse me. You see what I mean? That, that, that uh, we had a whole tutorial last time. We were already talking about multiple things last time, so I kind of left it out <laughs> last time, then felt badly after. Um, and that shows you the power of being able to emit a function, basically, or the results of a function, because that can be even more dynamic than our, <laughs> our regular dynamic parameters, which are to pull randomly, to pull in a series, to pull from a min-max. Um, and uh, those are indeed dynamic, but they're kind of set dynamic, whereas a function really is dynamic in any way you want, so it can be completely different. That was how, for instance, we uh, emitted snowflakes back in here. So let's take a look at that under examples and collections. Remember this one right here? Uh, this was using the emitter and the snowflakes. I'm not sure if we ever looked at this, but those snowflakes, each one is the result of a function and therefore they're uh, quite dynamic or completely different. Okay. Um, so closing down this stuff, let's go and start up a new FLA. And I had mentioned before as well, there's a way that we can, there's a way that we can, um, call uh, under more settings we can import our profile and so forth but another way to deal with this is just to copy the file so let's copy the file here file save as and we'll call this one 06 and uh, why don't we call it components then components have we done yeah that's right okay components sounds good save and now it will, well, be the same as it was before. If I go control enter, it opens up the tile stuff, which is, we don't want that, but we can easily go F9 and make some changes here. So we'll call this one number six and call that components. By the way, in 
in that last one, I also wrote in a little bit about ZIMV values. They were introduced in version five. So when we re re watched or when we watched the um, the last tutorial, we noticed that we didn't mention they're called ZIMV values because they were introduced in version five of Zim, which is called V. All of the Zim versions start with or have three three letters in them. Uh, one duo tri fourth the number four T H V six hep oct neo ten cat NFT and then Zim. <laughs> the last version. Last version current version of Zim is Zim version Zim. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, It'll probably be the last uh, ver major version of Zim because we're quite stable. Like we've we've uh, we've been building now for almost ten years, and made so much in Zim that uh, we've pretty well made everything <laughs> or come close to it anyway. So uh, that's great. All right, um, that happened to Flash, by the way. Uh, you know, I know you're an animate. Oh, and my apologies as well. We re-listened to or listened to some of the previous tutorials, and I think I might have called animate flash uh, my apologies I, I worked in flash for years and um director before that but flash itself became quite stable after a while and it was interesting going to the flash conferences because it, they, they would announce very under the hood kind of things for performance and not really exactly new features as much <laughs> And and that that was one of the uh, the issues, I guess, with Flash is people thought it wasn't changing or, or growing, and it's sort of like, well, of course it's not. It's been it's so complete and so beautiful as is. You know, stop expecting uh, new brand new features all the time. It's, it's just it, you know you can only bloat so much. <laughs> Um, but anyway, that, that was a misconception by people thinking that, you know, just because it isn't growing or changing that it's, that it's um, not good. Same with CreateJS. CreateJS was perfect for what it was, it, 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 perfect for what it is. It's, it, it gives us the, the, the bomb, the bitmap object model, and it gives us events and it's perfect. It, we don't really need it to grow. Uh, if it grew, then it would turn into Zim. So <laughs> we got all Zim here. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so uh, a little bit of philosophy behind there, huh? What are we doing again? Ah, yeah, components. We are still given those things. Great. But let's just start over again. Blah, 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 and talk about the tile thing. Okay, so new tile. Remember, this is our default tile dot center and we're going to make some components so let's have a look at our default tile there it is and what's happening is it's cloning this first object that many times uh, to get the tile but sometimes we might want a couple things here so something like const um, button is equal to a new button so there's a default button and const, well, what other ones haven't we seen? How about dial? It's a bit odd tiling a dial, a uh, new dial. It's not the end of the world, but um, so const slider, but sliders and dials are the, basically the same thing, but the slider is a either horizontal or a vertical line, whereas the dial, it takes that line and curves it around a dial, but otherwise it, they work pretty well the same. So it's a form factor primarily, a new slider. All right, let's just start by tiling those three things. So if we want to tile those three things, we pass in an array of button, comma, dial, comma, slider. So this is how you could do your movie clip as well. Here's one movie clip, here's a different movie clip, here's another movie clip, and then pass them in as an array. But I think you'll know what will happen if we do this. Uh, let's give it, there's three of them, so we'll do three across and one row. And we can put in a horizontal spacing of say 30. I'm not sure uh, how big this will look. Mm, we've done something wrong somewhere. Oh, that's a capital. <laughs> what were we doing? Were you were you sitting there going, no, 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 those are capital letters. Okay, so those are each from the class, button, dial, and slider. There, let's try again. 
All right, so here's what we get. And it's kind of like, what? What is going on? What I mean by the, the, the dot, it, note that they're not center aligned. So we'll probably want to set some alignment on these as well. They're all top left aligned. But what's going on? <laughs> you know, so what's happening here is Zim is using the Zim V value to randomly pick from these. So each time we're running it, it's randomly picking from this array. Unless you go, well, null here for the, so this is the spacing in the horizontal. Since we have one column, we don't really need any spacing in the vertical. And then the next parameter here is true. So usually after our uh, number of calls, number of rows, spacing in the horizontal, spacing in the vertical, if we pass in true, true means unique. So true means unique from array. All right, so when Tile was built, it was built primarily as an art piece in a sense, you know, where it could actually make tiles, like visual, beautiful tiles. <laughs> and we do use it for tiling and have made many uh, art pieces with Tile. But then we realized it's kind of handy sometimes to um, handle, say, tiling our components here, like a, a panel of interfaces. Much like in HTML, we did that with tables. Um, so tile can also act as a table. And as a matter of fact, has a lot of features that even will make it a bit more responsive than your average table. And not only that, we also have the wrapper. So a wrapper is more like the flex box in CSS. If you've done any CSS um, that makes it fully wrappable and responsive. But anyway, uh, tiles can still be used for this kind of thing. Anyway, let's put the true on there. And uh, so what we did is partway through the tiles existence, we sort of said, hmm, well, tiles could be handy if we didn't clone something. And therefore, uh, another thing about cloning is cloning does not clone events. So what you would, if you had a bunch of cloned stuff, you would have to put the events on afterwards rather than on before. But here with the unique set to true, you can put the events right here on, on these objects, on each of the objects when you make them, makes sense, and then tile them. And those, uh, it's not cloning them, it's only um, positioning them. So that's great. Best of both worlds with this true. All right, let's try it. So now we have a button and a dial and a slider and we refresh. And every time we refresh, we've got a button, a dial, or a dial and a slider. Those are defaults, by the way. We can make those look, we have a bunch of different buttons. We've got special sort of effects for these. We have colors, etc. You can make even unique buttons if you want. Should we though center those up? Um, haven't shown you a style yet. I think that will probably work best here. So we've passed in one, two, three, four, five, six parameters the first six parameters to tile there. We could, if we want to get to a line, uh, you know, we, we come out here and take a look, where is a line? So we go to the docs, we go to tile, and uh, here is the align way down here in V-align. We have a bunch of other things. Widths and heights, if we want to specify the widths and heights of columns, squeezing, column size, and then we get to align and v-align. We can also limit the count so it would tile, uh, but not maybe not complete if it only tile up to a count. We can mirror, we can, uh, etc. So we've got a fair bit here going on, and we would have to go null. So we got to unique, we'd have to go null, 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 and then center and center. So that would be a lot. Instead, we can go to the Zim Duo technique if we want, which would mean we are tiling the object or, or whatever it is. That, oh, we put in the squiggly brackets. We're tiling the object. We're tiling the um, calls. We're tiling the rows. We're tiling, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, rows is a default one, so we could get rid of that. But, um, oh no, it isn't. Well, I can't remember. I think if we put in calls, then rows becomes a default one. If we don't, then there's the default three. 
But anyway, that, that's one way to do it, it, except now we have to name each of these, which is a little bit long. The other way to do it is use zim style. So style is equal to, which means maybe we could say components and style, maybe here. Style is equal to, and we can apply a style of align colon center and v align colon center. That. And then anything that gets made after we've applied uh, made this style, so anything that gets made after will have these alignments. Uh, if we then want to turn that off, where am I going to? <laughs> if we then want to turn the alignment off or th those styles off, we say style is equal to squiggly brackets and the styles are cleared and from now on there's no more styles. So CS or styles in Zim is a little bit different than CSS in that we have to make the style before we make the object. So we make we as soon as we set a style, any objects that get made from that point on will pay attention to that style. Remember, or maybe I think I already went through style once with you guys. I'm not sure. But um, we can apply the style to everything like that, or we could apply the style specifically to a tile by saying, all tiles will have these styles. So it's not like every object will be aligned. Uh, well, not every object has an align parameter. So whatever objects have an align parameter, a V align parameter, would have been styled in that way. And then here, uh, now it's not every, every um, object. It's only tiles that will be styled in this certain way. And that's a little bit safer. But if we know that there's, you know, if we're just going to turn it off again right after, we, we don't have to bother with that. Okay, so you get the idea. So ahead of time, you could style everything that you're going to make, put it up top, and just leave it at that. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, or what we usually do is turn off and on certain styles. Another way to turn the style off is use the style class and say dot clear. So there's, there's this capital styles, which works like this, basically. And then there's also ways to apply specific methods to um, basically you can do all of this stuff in, with methods. Okay, um, and have a look in the docs under styles and you can see that. So e either of these would have been fine. I usually just use a shorter one. <laughs> and that was the one that was made first. So initially we made it like this only. And then partway through the styles existence, we added uh, methods right on the style class that basically duplicate. They, they allow us to remember styles and bring them back and uh, so we could uh, change styles, e any of these styles directly. There's also for style you can set a group so there's a group parameter for every object and if you assign the group of big or something then you can say hey in here uh, big we'll get these styles. So this is any name that we want. It's like a CSS class, except since we're coding here and we already use classes, we didn't want to use the word class. So we have um, group, it's called. So we can uh, assign this certain tiles to a group. Other tiles don't have a group or a different group or something. And then we can apply styles to the group specifically by putting the group name, uh, be capital, Gig. <laughs> Big groups are often not capitalized, so there you go. All right, and that's like a class. <clears throat> so that's a little bit on styles, which is pretty darn cool. The other thing that's cool about styles is they accept Zim V values. So we could align, uh, well, uh, the first tile that gets made would be a line center. If we make another tile later, we could say in a series that that's a line left. So then it would be a, a series like this. We can just say, hey, series, the first one is center, the next one is left, the next one is right, or something like that. And then the first tile that gets made will be centered, the next tile will be left, the next one. Isn't that amazing? And if we wanted random, then we would put in an array here, and then randomly it would pick from that. Every time we make a style, it just randomly picks from that. Or we could put a function and do results on the function. Other things with big, for instance, if you had um, something like a radius or whatever, or a width, uh, you could 
I do the same thing here with a min of 10 and a max of uh, 50. And then anything that was big would pick randomly for radius between those things. So we can use the zim v values in any of the styles here like that. Anyway, I'm not going to bother doing that, but I comment this out, I suppose, here. Toggle, 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 uncomment, comment. Okay. And then for the align, we're not going to bother. We'll just center that. So, uh, uh, by the way, the capital center like that is the same as saying a small center like that. We used to always do this, but then we introduced these zim constants with, with capital letters, and so can do either. And we go control enter and let's see what we've got. Now we've got aligned in the center our objects and that looks nicer, doesn't it? Okay, see how the objects are aligned in the center, probably the ver vertical alignment that we were noticing there. But if we had a second row of, of other ones, then we would see, put, say we put a dial there, it would be aligned in the center, would look nice. Okay. Great, so there are those components that have been tiled that we looked at a few. And we, maybe we can make a grid of components if you want, just to have a peek at some. Const, mm, what else do we have? We have a stepper. Stepper is equal to a new stepper. And const, Mm, so a stepper will step through things. Uh, we have a toggle is equal to a new toggle. Do another one, const. There's a radial menu. That's going to expand. It might be a bit awkward to have something that gets bigger inside of our tiles. We won't bother with that one. There is an indicator, indicator is equal to a new indicator. All right, and let's try adding those to our tile here. Maybe we'll drop this down just so we can kind of see them better. So a dial, uh, then we had a stepper, a toggle, and an indicator here. Stepper, what was it? Stepper, <laughs> toggle, toggle. Toggle and an indicator there. And we better put two, two columns, so three by two now. And we refresh this, uh, control enter. I did something wrong. Let's have a look at the error message, F12. Stepper. <laughs> I never do that. Never ever have I ever <laughs> made my classes lowercase and I've done it twice today. Okay. Oh, and an indicator. Two, three times. Did you catch me on that? I can't believe that. I never do that. And I did toggle. What? <laughs> is, this, is something magically going lowercase? Like, hey, who, who's playing? Who's hacking me? Who's hacking me live here? All right. The stepper is huge. So uh, we better scale that a little bit. There's the toggle. Also, it looks like we could use some more space here. Isn't that funny, though, that I actually got the um, I got the sizes kind of close, didn't I? <laughs> you know, the long thing next to this and a short thing and a medium thing here. That's pretty good. A good guess. Let's make the stepper a little bit smaller, though. Dot ska 0.5. Uh, stepper's kind of neat in that it... And here's what I meant by tiling the, do the dial is a little bit awkward because the um, these sticks aren't counted in the size of the dial. Um, and so it's kind of getting in the way there. And also the spacing isn't enough to handle certain widths or something. So anyway, let's uh, fix that up a little bit here with... <clears throat> uh, we have... Oh, yeah. Okay, that's that's what's going on. Um, there's no vertical spacing. So this thing is bumping right up against that one no vert because we haven't set any vertical spacing. And these little sticks are not counted as the, in the size of the dial. So we want some vertical spacing now. We can go, let's go 50-50. I think we got enough room that 50-50 would be good. And then we get um, a little bit tidier now, isn't it? OK. 
Okay, so steppers can also step through words, which is kind of cool. So you could put, it's almost like a pull down menu that has a bunch of options. We can do that with a list and the list has a pull down version of it. But before we had the list, we often just used the stepper. So all the options would be here and you can step through them and you can step fast through them or going up or down. So sort of drag on it like that, or you can press it to step or hit the arrows to step or hit um, the arrows on the keyboard to step. Okay, and those could be a series of words as well in the stepper, so it's quite a versatile. You can also step through decimals and stuff by providing little arrows here and here. So they've got other arrows to say do whole numbers here, but decimals with these other arrows. So it's a nice, a nice component there. You can color it all and style it, etc. So there we go. There's uh, the indicator is not interactive unless we set interactive to true on that. So then you can start styling up here. Oh, we made we made all these things here though, so we could apply styles to um, any of these as well as we go by putting a style here or moving this style up. Okay, and then we could style um, all of that stuff. So for instance, here is an example of Zim that has been styled. So under examples, look for something that says style. I think it's up top here. Well, we'll do a little search on it. style. There it is, CSS for canvas. It's not really CSS, but this, this is what it would look like if we just turned all our background colors to pink or white or whatever. So this is a, a sort of a pink and blue, a pink and blue style, uh, situation. Okay. Nice, huh? Yeah, maybe not nice. <laughs> yeah. hard, hard, hard to say if we want to call that nice or not. But this was introduced in Zim Oct 8. And so you'll see in the docs if uh, components, well, all the components, I think, um, receive style then it will explain that in the at the top of the parameters saying it supports zim oct so it'll say supports zim duo supports zim oct supports zim v or supports zim duo v and then oct i guess those are the three main ones there's also the zim fourth uh, methods so those are all the methods that were introduced in zim fourth which was the fourth version of zim at the number four th to get three letters all right, so those are some of the terms that we use. You can see any of those terms. I think we define them here under devs. I can't remember for sure. Let's have a look. So this is a site specifically for devs to show how to use Zim inside of React and Angular and Vue and so forth, and then various features, code info. Here are the versions. And uh, well, anyway, those those are a series of versions there, and and what was introduced in those versions, somewhere I thought we described. Oh, I remember where it was in uh, Zim down here. The gold bars of Zim, nice. The gold bars. So isn't isn't that funny? So these are the main links up above here. Um, but people's footer links are sometimes ignored or whatever, so we turn them into gold bars, which <laughs> makes, makes them a bit more fun to find. And in the tips of the gold bars, right here is a glossary of the terms, and there is Duo V. Uh, looks like we didn't put in Oct. Uh, but Duo and V are the terms we primarily use. Otherwise, we would use Style. Uh, we don't usually call it Oct, but... In the docs, if we take a look at the docs, for instance, and go to um, a, a blob or what have you, then we can see, it doesn't say oct here, but blobs do, so, oh, there it is, supports oct. Okay, so supports duo, see that? Supports duo, parameters, uh, normal parameters are a single object with properties below supports V and it gives us the quick view of these, uh, what are called pick literals. So there's the array for random, the min max for range, the series, and then the results of a function. Okay. And then supports oct as well. Parameter defaults can be set with style control like CSS. So any components that have those. And then each of the individual ones will say which ones can be V. 
So not everything, like we didn't do border width V, we've only done certain ones as V, okay. All right, uh, I think that that's pretty good though. We didn't put events on those, but you can imagine what the events would be like. Ooh, how are we doing for time? We're sitting at 40 minutes. I do see something that we could do. We could set an event on the dial that would adjust the slider and vice versa. Do you want to try it? So we can say dot change there. So, or we could say dot on change, but we wouldn't want to, we don't want to, um, if we put the on here, dot on change, then this no longer is the dial being stored in here. It would be a, an ID to turn it off. So we can't change, we can change the on, but the results won't be the object. So, or, sorry, we can't chain the on. Oh, or sorry, we, <laughs> we can put the on on the end of that and it will work, but the results of what we're assigning will no longer be the object. It would be this and we couldn't chain anything after, so we couldn't do dot center or whatever there. Okay, so um, we've made a tap or a change event. So if we do a change, then we just put the function in here. And so our function will be our arrow function. I'm in uh, animate, so I go like that, and like this, and like that, and like that, I guess. So inside of here, we can say slider dot current value equals, now let's drop it down. Slider dot current value equals dial dot current value. Okay, and we would do the same thing onto the end of the slider except reverse them. So slider dot change and we reverse these two. Cut that, put it there, and take the slider, cut that, and put it there. And Adam may have a little toggle that would flip those. But anyway, uh, dial equals the slider's current value. Are you ready? And we update here. Hopefully this will work. Whoa. Whoa. What do you think? Very cool, huh? You could also do that with what's called wire. And Zim's got wire, and you can just wire the dial to the slider. And with an extra parameter of true, you can make it go both both ways, so that's pretty cool. But that shows you an example of how we can apply an event to the uh, these components, pass them into the tile, make the tiling unique. So there's the unique true, so that it doesn't randomly pick those. And by the way, if if it did randomly pick those and we didn't have true there, these events don't get cloned. The very first one that gets made would be there and might have the event on it. Yeah, it should have the event on it, but the ones that get cloned after it would be, uh, they don't copy over, the events don't get cloned, only the objects themselves get cloned. Okay, so there's some ideas, and of course we would set other events on these other things, and we've got a control panel. All right, and we actually have a, a panel that all of these could have been added to. So we could have just tiled these and added them to a panel. Yay! <laughs> Why don't we end it there? That was a long one, huh? Woo! Um, are you happy with long ones or would you rather them shorter? You're welcome to let us know in some comments and also come on by and visit us at zimjs.com slash slack, zimjs.com slash discord. And you can leave us any comments there too. We'll, we'll get back to you, right? You can communicate, hang out with us. That would be great. I'm Dr. Abstract. This has been a Zim tutorial for Adobe Animate, where we did some clarification on how to use a function in a Zim V value, so dynamic parameters. We saw the advantages of that, and we tidied up our last tutorial a little bit. And then we also talked about how we can tile uniquely. And you would have to do that for your movie clip as well. I just found out that movie clips in Adobe Animate can't be cloned. So uh, that's the deal. You'd have to do them uniquely like we just did. 
Hey, it's been it's been a delight to, to be with you. I love doing these, and hopefully, you like working with Zim and can help you in Adobe Animate uh, make more cool stuff. Cheers. Take it easy.